Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest from Florida. Uh, Chris, you may have seen him floating around on Twitter. Um, he's pretty vocal about what's going on in the crypto space in terms of decentralization and maybe some of the smoke and mirrors that are going on and calling out some of the BS. Now, some people don't like that and he rubs them up the uh, wrong way and obviously on the channel we like to explore all opinions and some of these issues aren't spoken about enough and I think you're going to find some of them really interesting from some of the blue chip projects as well. So welcome to the channel, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Do you want to maybe start off um, as well for, for my own benefit and give us your full background because I mean, I've seen you floating around on crypto Twitter and YouTube and a year or two ago, you were pumping out some of the best DeFi tutorials and then you kind of, I guess, fell out of love with Ethereum in the space uh, as much maybe or had some concerns or yeah, I just love to hear your journey, your background and then sort of what changed. I um, discovered Bitcoin in 2015 <clears throat> and used it as a payment mechanism but didn't really fully understand it until 2017 and that's when I really fell down the rabbit hole with Bitcoin and appreciated it because of my sort of background as a, like a libertarian and just that whole like freedom from fiat and stuff like that and really understanding for the first time the nature of money uh, and, and you know all this all the stuff that we all absorb when we um, fall in love with Bitcoin yeah and uh, so I was in that space for a while I'm trying to do educational stuff just trying to contribute however I could still was working full time and a couple of years later uh, I discovered DeFi. And uh, this was like obviously after the big bear market of 2018 and everything, and DeFi started to bubble up. And it captured my imagination because it was really the first time that I saw an opportunity for a decentralized service that could potentially be a companion to the decentralized currency, which was Bitcoin. Because as we all know, it's hard to use Bitcoin in a decentralized service. Most of us use centralized exchanges and things like that. So I saw an opportunity for that potentially to happen on Ethereum. And so I got very excited about it. And I started to create, I have kind of a background in marketing and video and um, explaining technical concepts. My background was in like working with tech startups as a growth director and stuff like that. So uh, I decided let's apply that to this. Let's create some video content that's going to get people um, excited, get normal people that aren't developers well-versed enough in the ideas that they're able to use it. They don't have to know all the code and all the details, but yeah. just like get them over that hump the same way we did with Bitcoin, right? It's like, just get them over the bridge, that philosophical bridge, and then it'll start to come to them. So I started to create that content in 2019, which really, you know, obviously we don't know for sure, but from my anecdotal, like just stuff that I've heard, it's I, those videos have onboarded like maybe thousands of people into mm, DeFi, yeah. you know, through synthetics and Ave videos and stuff like that. And then early in 2020, I uh, there was we started to talk about admin keys in DeFi, and we started to realize that they were the protocols and the projects and stuff weren't as decentralized as we thought, mm -hmm. and they weren't trustless, and there was centralized control that was retained by the development teams. And when I first discovered that, uh, first we were talking about Compound. That's the first one that people started to discuss. And then I dug in and saw, oh my goodness, like basically every project can drain the funds, can shut down the protocol, can freeze everything, could potentially be regulated by a government. You know, uh, So I started to out that information. And the more I did it, the more shocked people were. And so mm -hmm. I just kept going down that road. And it's really, it's been about a year and a half just going down that road. And the reason I do it is not to try to kill DeFi. It's to potentially strengthen DeFi and make yeah, it more bulletproof. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, people so that's talk my real. Yeah, people talk about yeah. Bitcoin as the honey badger. Like, you know, you've got to, whatever doesn't kill it makes it stronger. Um, it's important mm -hmm. to highlight these things. And when you say you sort of discovered it, are you, because I'm not technically, like, I can't read code. So is that the sort of thing that you can do? Or how did you discover this type of stuff? No, we started to, um, other people started to bring up the topic around Compound. Mm. Uh, somebody wrote a long blog post in the community about the admin key and explained what it could do. And they kind of labeled it an admin key, which is like like a layman's term yeah, basically yeah. for an EOA wallet that has the ability to 
do these owner functions on the smart contract. Yes. So I'm not a developer, but I knew enough about smart contracts to be able to to take a look and see if there were similar keys and similar functions on other smart contracts. And we're really lucky to have Etherscan, which is a great tool to try to just, as a non-developer, look at these things and look for the functions. And And I was asking around the community too, and the um, developers were acknowledging, yeah, we have this, we have this. So I started to like make spreadsheets and try to just put it all together and make some video content. To um, my, my real goal was, see, what I found is people were coming into DeFi with the expectation that it was just as trustless as Ethereum and Bitcoin yes. on the base layer. Mm. And nobody was giving them the information they needed to understand that that wasn't true. Yeah. So yeah. it was like error through uh, omission, you know, like as far as that. So as soon as they had that information, their mind was like, oh, wow, okay, we're not dealing with exactly what we thought here. Yeah, to me, it's a little bit like... Some of the times they're not always transparent about it. Other times they are. And then you've got like these rug pulls and scams more recently, right? And they'll deliberately put in these things like these override functions or these keys so that they can just, you know, rug pull or take the money at any time. And But then you've got legitimate projects that might actually have the exact same thing. And they're not being malicious necessarily. But the issue is twofold. Like one, they might have just one team member that turns on them and just the fact that there is that ability there or they might get hacked. And then again, that ability is there. So even if they do mean well, there's, there are some problems with it. And I guess just in general, most projects have taken this stance of you've got to start off somewhere like centrally and things like the SEC have described, well, you've maybe got three years to decentralize. So I guess that's the general sort of thinking of a lot of projects is, yeah, it's there to begin with and then we'll try and fade it out. Um, is, do you agree with that or what are your sort of views on that? I, I Okay, so personally, I, I believe that any project that doesn't start trustlessly will never get there. Um, especially if their goal is to raise capital, get investors, have a company behind it, and try to turn a profit. Because as we all know, decentralization is clunky, it's slow, it's dirty, it's hard to use, it's never more profitable uh, than centralization. It's like comparing a Bitcoin to PayPal, right? It's yeah. like PayPal slicker, it's easier to run as a business, etc. cetera. Um, so personally, I don't think it's possible. Uh, but I'll say this, my goal in the space is not to like, stop anybody from doing anything. Mm. My goal in the space is for uh, full transparency for users and a full understanding of the risks, right? So yeah. if there is what you just mentioned, like if there is a multi-sig that's held by anonymous people, um, you know, and they could run away with the funds at any moment, there's nothing I can do to shut them down because I don't even know who they are. And there's nothing a regulator can do to shut them down either. Yeah. Right, but what we can do is make sure that every user that's entering that project um, knows about the issue, or through the omission from the anonymous team, they're concerned about that. Right. Mm, yeah. So I've been trying to just educate users to look for this stuff. If you go into it and you know, okay, there's six anonymous people, th uh, three of them could sign off and run away with the funds. I know that I'm going to put my money in anyway. Then. I have nothing to say about that. It's yeah. a free country. Like do whatever yeah. you want with your money. Yeah. But there's other people, there's other people who just they don't know what they don't know. So they haven't gotten over that that sort of mental hurdle yet. It's kind of like before you really understand Bitcoin, right? It's like yeah. you're spending it, you can use it, you can buy it on Coinbase and yeah. places like that, but you don't really fully understand it enough to know what you don't know. Yeah. And I yeah. find that happens a lot with DeFi too when people are first getting into it. Mm. Um one thing you said then I found interesting was starting off trustlessly and then you said with the company behind it. So, I mean, to me, I don't think you can be – or are you talking about in terms of maybe access to the funds and certain things? So, some aspects like a company are obviously centralized versus a DAO, but are you talking more about like the admin keys to access funds and override functions needs to be trustless? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, the, the on-chain protocol, the on-chain on -chain, code. Okay. Um, most, pretty much all of the top DeFi projects have companies behind them. They're corps, LLCs, you know, whatever. Um, there's 
Uniswap has one. Compound has a company. They have employees. They have to file taxes. Yeah. They have to comply with regulations. So as soon as you go down that road, and you, and then if you also try to raise capital to build your company, you're going to owe a return to those investors. And those investors we've seen now, the investors' main strategy in this space is get a token out there, sell the token, airdrop the token. We'll wait till it goes up in value and we'll make money that way as, as mm. opposed to generating fees on the on the code, on the project. So once you get down that road, the odds of you being able to go to a fully trustless um, situation are pretty much gone. Um, Uniswap is a unique example, though, of a project that did launch trustless code but still found a way to drop a token. And that token's causing all kinds of controversy and stuff like that, but the token community can't touch the code. The code is trustless, immutable. If you want to use the new version of Uniswap, you have to move your liquidity mm. to the new version. They can't change what's already there. Mm. So they deployed trustlessly, um, but their company uh, got a little greedy, raised capital, airdropped the token, um, and now is going through all kinds of situations with that. So mm. it's it's an interesting dichotomy between the two sides of it. Yeah, and I think um, like one of the themes that I've been talking about for this year has been DAOs, and we've seen you know Synthetics, Kyber, you know, a lot of projects talking about going to more of a DAO model. But then again, you've still got well, what is happening on chain is different to what they're maybe talking about. But um, do you want to talk about those issues with Uniswap? Because I know the one that I've been keeping sort of half an eye on is the um, is it Harvard and they've applied for these grants that you can get and then they're such a big token holder they can almost like vote themselves in just to give themselves money. So then there's a couple of issues there. It's, well, who are the whales that can just get votes over the line to give themselves money? And then why are we giving it to like a rich establishment that's probably just got a heap of money from the government through bailouts and whatever this year as well? Like it just seems so wrong to me that that money should be going to decentralized projects and people that need it. There's so many more better users uses of it yeah so yeah you're exactly right and the way just to back up to like the uniswap airdrop that everybody knows about with the uni token um it was airdropped to users of the project in the past yeah. right so you know if you're watching this odds are you might have got a little bit of uni token yeah, yeah. Uh, if you were using uniswap before the airdrop so and if you didn't sorry man but um at the same time, there was also distribution to investors, early investors, um, venture capital firms, uh, the team members themselves that had been there since the beginning, and rightfully so. Like they should get a share of what's going on. Yes. Uh, so uh, each uni token represents one vote in the governance community. Now, uni tokens, like I just mentioned, they can't do a whole lot. Like most of the protocols like Aave and Compound and Curve and all the other ones, they have tokens that can actually make meaningful changes to the to the code, yes. right? They can actually really affect things. The Uni token was designed in a way where it can't really do much. It can uh, control the treasury, which the treasury was built at the time of the, the token launch. It was bolted on afterwards, and so the things it can do are sort of like the afterwards things, yeah. Right, right, right. So. Um, there's limited things. So, but one of the things that came up recently was a proposal to create what they were calling the DeFi Defense Fund. And Harvard Law, like you mentioned, they proposed this fund. And the idea was it would basically be a committee of seven people. And they would, um, and it, the initial ask was for $40 million worth of uni to create this fund that would then be responsible for lobbying and, and uh, working with regulators to educate them about DeFi and to, to try to strive for fair regulations. And, and, and you say like $40 that. million. Um, it's a massive treasury, though, isn't it? How big roughly is that uni treasury? The treasury, I believe, is I think it's over $2 billion <laughs> worth at current value. Yeah, okay. So it's huge. Yeah. It's a huge treasury. Um, I don't know the exact number of uni that's in there. It's all on chain, though. It's it's there for everybody. So so yeah. One uh, where they settled when they kind of went through and they did a second draft of this proposal was at one bill uh, one million uni, which at current values uh, is around eighteen or nineteen million dollars. Yeah. So um, the idea was there'd be seven committee members, uh, which were named in the proposal, and uh, basically all the terms were laid out 
before the proposal was made public. It was a very detailed proposal. Here's the committee members. Here's the projects they're coming from. Um, there's a member of the World Economic Forum on this committee. Clearly, it had all been worked out before the proposal was brought forth. Mm. Um, Harvard Law is one of a few of, of several delegates that the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz has delegated their voting power to. And they've been public about this. They put it on their blog. Um, so they had enough voting power just with this one group to push the proposal to a vote. You need, um, I forget the exact number of uni you need, but you need a certain amount of uni tokens in order to get a proposal to an actual on-chain vote. So it's a lower threshold for a vote and then a higher threshold to pass a vote. Yeah. 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 So just to get it on on there for an actual vote, you need a certain amount of uni. And it's a lot. It's millions. I forget the exact number. Um, but they had it. So... Uh, the the problem in the first part of that was that there was a lot of questions, a lot of feedback, a lot of why do you need this much money? And a lot of how did you come to, the, to these seven people? And also, how do we know that they're going to work in the best interests of uni token holders? And is this being done in response to, like, do you know about some regulation or some investigation that's coming down the pike? Mm. Or, like, what what conversations did Harvard Law have with other parties to come up with this proposal? Mm. You know, who first called each committee member and, like, worked it out with them? And so, like, there were all these questions that I detailed in a letter that's on defiwatch.net. And th that was really compiled um, – from a lot of different sources, from attorneys in the space and other people who are just interested in this stuff. And um, so we really pushed that and we, we saw that as an opportunity to get some answers because uh, we knew that they could basically push it to a vote and get it approved uh, by the vote mm -hmm. uh, just with the voting power that was delegated by Andreessen Horowitz, other VC firms yeah. and Uniswap team members who got you know, a mm. lot of tokens, they could do it without us. So um, we figured, well, we just need to make an effort to try to try to democratize this space. Mm. You know, the idea is that this is supposed to be a decentralized governance community. So if we ask some questions, we got to get answers to them or else it'll just look like they're just ramrodding this thing yeah. through. Yeah. But we didn't and it got ignored. And then next thing you know, it goes to a vote and it got... Um, enough yes votes from just a handful, maybe like seven or eight parties. All of them were delegates of other entities. <clears throat> we definitely know some of them were delegates of Andreessen, probably other VCs, probably Uniswap team members. I don't, we can't know for sure. We asked the question, but we haven't been told who delegated all the votes, but you're talking about millions and I mean, it, all, it came down to like 30 or 40 million votes for the proposal, uh, which if you think about is, is like, 80 to 100 million dollars worth of uni uh and it's from maybe seven or eight entities mm. so you're talking about big whales so somebody like me with my little couple of uni can't yeah. make a difference yeah yeah um but it did it got approved none of the questions were ever answered um and it's unfortunate because still to this day we don't have all the answers about how it came to be and who thought I mean, of it i mean like in that. hindsight this was before a lot of the recent talks because I think looking back now, there, there probably were things that they maybe knew because there's been a lot of talk about DeFi regulation and cracking down and blah, 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 regulation of stable coins possibly. So yeah, that's that, that, that's really interesting. And and have there been any even like uh, responses or acknowledgement that no, we're not going to respond to it or like what's the closest you've got to talking to someone or getting an answer? Um, the closest I got was somebody on the Uniswap team basically um, saying what you just said, like, we're not going to answer. And I mean, a common fallback for a lot of people in the community has been to fall back on, on the messenger who most frequently in the past few months has been me, mm -hmm. you know, and the, you know, they don't like the, the tone I'm using or they don't like my demeanor or whatever it might be. So they're, they ignore the substance of the question and they just go to like some kind of ad hominem, which, um, you know, I, I understand to a certain extent, like, how they can justify that in their head. But the fact that hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people in the community 
are looking at this as well and has asking the same questions. And again, it's not just me. There's groups of lawyers in the community, groups of um, P I've had, I've had government, I've had regulators DM me for with questions and concerns and you, stuff you, like I'm that. I'm just thinking out loud here. Do you think um, if you send it through uh, and, and maybe I'll tweet about it and um, like we're, I think of 120 odd thousand now and um, pretty well known in the Ethereum DeFi community, do you think that would be almost like too big to ignore if we get a bit of momentum behind that? And if I do that, I'll link it down below for you guys to read and see what happens. But um, yeah, hmm. absolutely. Any yeah. help, any bit would help like that. I think, um, yeah, it's it's been the, it's, it, it, they can't keep doing this for that much longer, you know? And it hasn't been just these guys. It was Polygon as well. I wrote an extensive letter to them with a bunch of questions. And I really got into this letter writing thing because I wanted to try to eliminate that excuse. I'm interviewing Sandeep wanted... from Polygon like in a couple of days. So shoot those questions through. Oh, okay. I'd be glad to. Yeah, they're very legitimate questions that everybody has. You know, with, with Polygon, it's about this multi-sig that they have that could be used to shut down the entire network. Okay, how is it being protected? What happens if a if a regulator calls you and says you have to use it? What happens if a regulator freezes your assets in this country? Are you gonna? Uh, do you have a plan? You know, so there's some very legitimate questions in there yeah, that um, could lead to real life situations. You know, I'll for, send them through to you for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, for people at home, I guess, um, maybe for beginners. So multi sig is just uh, multiple signatures, and so you might have like a three of five, and it just means you need like three people to all sign that transaction with their MetaMask or their Ledger or whatever um, to then do a transaction or execute a smart contract or whatever it is. So that's all we mean when we say multi-sig. And so Chris is talking about uh, someone like Polygon. It's a centralized or aspects of what they do are centralized. And so it's not like Ethereum or Bitcoin where it's kind of trustless. The blockchain and the function of what they're doing on that Polygon side chain, um, if push comes to shove and the question is, well, what does that look like? Is it regulators or is it a hack or is it just, you know, the $5 wrench attack where they all get um, attacked on the way home or, you know, so many things things can, and it might be unlikely, but they can take over that network, which has billions of dollars on it. Um, and the one that comes to mind for me was uh, REN, REN protocol. So you've got these kind of pools and the, like it's a privacy-based network blockchain, but then it got revealed that like Chris was saying, that there's still sort of a, a backup or a centralized, like a, a master key or an admin key. And it's like no point making everything else decentralized and private and blah, blah, blah. If once again, one person or a hacker that gets hold of this thing can just change the rules and, and steal the money and whatnot. So are there any other examples, Chris, that you've been talking about? Well, and those examples are good ones. And I'll, I'll say this, the most common response I get is this is only temporary. We're going to change this in the future. We have a roadmap to eliminate this point of centralization and decentralize it later. And my response is always, it's not about tomorrow. It's about what could happen today. Because if it's going to happen, it's going to happen today, it, the next day or the next day. Every single day between now and when you decentralize is a risk. And users should know. If a user wants to wait until that risk is gone, they should have the knowledge and the information to be able to do that. Uh, so I just, that's not a response that I accept. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of um, an example. I, I'm sure there was an example of someone that promised that they'd like burnt or destroyed the, the admin keys to a project. And then later on, it was revealed that they hadn't at all. And, and then they actually used it. Um, oh, you, anything come to your mind about, you know what I'm talking about or not? Um, the only thing that comes to my mind no, not specifically what you're anyway, saying. I did right. have a situation where Sushi Swap, um, I raised an issue with them. This is on DeFiWatch.net as well. I wrote about it because I thought it was important. I, I mean, they, they, I forget exactly what it was now. It was something about their multi-sig uh, and the time lock on it. I think it was that they, oh, it was that they had the ability to remove their own time lock. So it didn't make sense for a multi-sig to be able to sign one transaction and remove their own time lock. And they told me publicly that they were going to reassign it to a different multi-sig. So this other multi-sig with known people, like people from Compound and Ave and stuff, would be the ones to remove or change the time lock. Mm. Um, and they publicly tweeted about it and stuff, but then they never did it. And I didn't realize it for about six months or something like that. And then when I figured out what happened, I was like, wow, you know, you're going to go out there and publicly state this. 
uh, you know, so you you can't trust what we've learned over and over is you can't trust anything except what you see on chain. Mm. And it, words do not matter in this space as much as people want them to. We've seen over and over you can't trust in people, even if they have the best of intentions. They could make mistakes. They could be pressured. They could be blackmailed. They could get a you know their assets frozen. You don't you never know what's coming down the pike. Yeah. And I by guess, the way, um, another good. Oh, you go. So, you go. Yeah. I was just gonna say another good ongoing example of this is this Shiba swap thing <laughs> with the Shiba coin, right? So we all know about the Shiba token, um, but they these anonymous people created Shiba swap, which I'm all for anonymity in the space. I think anonymity is great and it's important and privacy is very important. But when anonymous people launch a DeFi project with a key, which could be used to take all the money at any moment without any notice or any delay, you're playing with fire. You're a maniac for putting your money into that because you don't know who they are. You don't know where they are. You have no idea what their intentions are. That is what's happening with Shiba Swap. It's over a billion dollars worth of um, value locked in there, mostly from people who have no idea what they're doing. Um, and it's, uh, I want to say it's a um, six of nine multi-sig or something like six people have to. But again, the other thing with multi-sigs is you have no idea how they're being secured or how they were created. And I, I put a video on Twitter the other day showing a demo of how one person could create all nine keys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold them. I mean, it's, most people in, that are new don't understand that. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, like yeah. you can create all the keys and just sit on them yourself. And then if you're anonymous, you just say, yeah, there's nine people when it's really just you behind your keyboard with all nine. Hmm. Yeah, no. I think hopefully from the stuff that we've spoken about over the years in education, people kind of understand um, these things pretty well. I guess what I want people at home to understand is the fact that there's different um, levels and aspects of decentralization and, and trustlessness and censorship resistance. So there's the code, then there's you know just access to the treasury, and you know people talk about oh well, EOS is is centralized because there's 21 nodes. Well, that's kind of maybe the technical setup, but then you've got these other things like the yeah you know, on, on, on chain the code so there's many different levels of well what are the project doing is that what's the trustlessness and are they being transparent about everything um and hopefully people are starting to understand that from chats like this exactly it's it's a little bit of a complicated thing to talk about you know because decentralization is definitely a scale there's no perfect decentralization and there's no perfect centralization like there's a it's a spectrum but Bitcoin is the best that we've got, right? It's like the best that we have seen in the space uh, as far as decentralization goes and as far as setting up a, a governance system that uses decentralization and friction in a way to make it really hard to make changes, mm. right? And that's the best we've gotten. So in my opinion, there's no way, there's no reason that DeFi can't get to that level of trustlessness. It can if it wants to, but... That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing the other end of the spectrum, and we're seeing stuff in DeFi that's so centralized that one person can sit down, type a few keys, and drain a billion dollars into their own wallet. Yeah. Like it doesn't get more centralized than that. And they're they're covering it up with this curtain of decentralization, this theater that's not real. Yeah. And people just don't want to. It's this mental barrier that people have. They figure if it's on chain, it's legit. But with Ethereum, that's not the case at all. No, I guess um, for people at home, I'm just thinking, what, what can you do? I mean, you can do things. I think really important example is maybe um, if you're using a Shiba swap, for example, uh, anything on MetaMask, you can go and have a look at what you've given access to. And there are websites now, I might try and link it down below, where you can like wipe everything that you've given it access to because some people don't realize when they use a smart contract and it says sign to give permission a lot of the time you'll be signing to give infinite access to a, to a coin and so every time you go to uniswap if a transaction uses um, usdt and you've clicked it once it won't ask you again but when you've gone to use the shiba swap or whatever sometimes your wallet is sitting there saying this thing has infinite access to whatever you've given it permission to in the past. Um, and so maybe that's one level of security that people can kind of do um, to maybe help some of these things. Any other things that come to mind, Chris? That's a great point because 
the draining of the funds that I'm talking about is specific to the liquidity providers that are providing funds for for the swaps to happen. But if you're just swapping, you know, token in, token out, you might think, oh, I'm safe. But you're not for the exact reason Alex just said. Like, you are giving that permission, and if somebody abuses that multi-sig, they could maliciously attack the funds you have in your wallet that you've given approval for. Mm. Even if you're not near your computer, even if you're not using your crypto, even if you have a hardware wallet, no matter what, if you've given that approval, then when you're clicking approve on USDC at any time in the future until you revoke that approval, they can grab those funds from your wallet. Do you know the website so, I'm talking uh, about? That um... yeah, there's a few. I think EtherScan actually has a function that does it now. If, uh, I could be wrong about that. I'll, I'll, also, I'll link it down below. But there's a really good one I found the other day. Yeah, yeah. Revoke.cash is one that springs to mind. Um, I'd be careful. Yeah, definitely put up a list uh, because <laughs> the way the way DeFi is today, you know, we could say one thing, you could mistype one character, go to the wrong website, but it looks exactly like the one we're yeah, talking yeah, about, yeah, and then yeah. it could be malicious. So, yeah. click on the links that Alex gives you. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's been a cool a cool discussion. Um, but hopefully, people have learned a lot because I mean, this is very technical stuff. Um, most people in this space aren't technical; they're just there swapping some coins, and they've got no idea probably about what we've just discussed um, in those last couple of points. Um, I'll link Chris's website and Twitter down below. Any other thoughts to finish off, Chris, or anything? Just, you know, the best thing for non-technical people to do is to stay skeptical uh, and realize if it's if it looks too good to be true, it may be. The higher the interest rate that they're offering, <laughs> the more risk that comes with it, probably yeah. the more centralization. Uh, so you just need to watch out. You know, you can follow me on Twitter and I try to call stuff out, but I'm, I'm more about, I want people to have these big ideas in their head. I'm not like specific to, there's other Twitter accounts that look at all these little projects and try to find problems. Um, But for me, it's really about just staying skeptical, being aware of what's going on and knowing that, that 50% of the time it could be fine. The other half, it could be a problem. Yeah. So you, you want to avoid the landmines. Yeah, I've done a lot of videos or one in particular where I really ran through how to identify scams and every single red flag that usually pops up and that really high reward and API, whenever I see that in the like thousands or hundreds of thousands, I, I just shake my head. And the reason they're doing that is for these last couple of points we've discussed. They want people to come to the website. They want people to sign those transactions with their MetaMask and hand over access and then when they rug pull or whatever, this is when they're making off with all these millions of dollars. So just another thing for people to be aware of. But um, no, that's that's great. I think that was exactly what I was hoping we'd um, cover today, Chris, and I'm sure you'll get a few new followers on Twitter and everything and we'll have to catch up again in future. Um, I'll try and tweet Uniswap and just say, hey, you know, I'd love to know what happened here and see if they get back to us. But um, yeah, awesome. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alex. Cool. See you guys.